Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at Quick Surf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do you feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show. If you have not already done so, you can subscribe on our website uh, to the video feed or an MP3 feed or an Augorbis feed, or you can catch us uh, at a variety of other websites, YouTube, Daily Motion, Blip.tv, uh, uh, Stitcher.com. Um, there's a whole variety of uh, places online that we distribute to. So uh, do feel free to uh, subscribe to uh, your method of choice. Let's go ahead and get to the cool stuff that I found for this episode. Um, over at makezine.com, introducing young makers to Arduino. This is a pretty cool article I ran across. Each month, the St. Louis Hackerspace, the Disruption Department's seven young ma maker fellows convene at Hack Days, which are five-hour-long introductions to a different sector of mechanical, electrical, or computer engineering. So... Uh, Pretty neat. Uh, the April event was hosted at a local co-working space in downtown St. Louis called T-Rex. And the hosts, co-founders of a company here called Evtron, let them, uh, led them on a tour of their fantastic working spaces and shared stories about how they came to work in technology, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty neat. Uh, definitely check it out. This is, you know, something that, you know, a lot of people really need to, to do with their younger people is, you know, introduce them to electronics and DIY and, you know, Arduino is a great place to start, uh, you know, kind of a simplistic, you know, programmable thing that, that young people can experiment around with, uh, definitely worth reading. From Ars Technica, more than 20,000 people apply for a one-way ticket to Mars. You have got to be absolutely bonkers. Apparently, at least 20,000 people are. Um, the Mars One uh, project, uh, it's a combination space mission slash reality TV show project that aims to send four lucky space travelers to the red planet forever. Interest in the project has been quite high, with the company's latest press release noting that it had received 10,000 messages from prospective applicants from over 100 countries, but that was before it started taking actual formal paid applications from would-be astronauts. Well, since they've started doing that, they've received at least 20,000 uh, applications at $38 a piece. Uh, in U.S. currency to formally apply for Mars One. Various sources around the internet, including China Daily, are reporting that the world is full of people who wouldn't mind living out the remainder of their days in a questionable camera-stuffed habitat on Mars. I am not one of those people. Uh, planet Earth is plenty big. There's still lots to see uh, here, right here on planet Earth. And... Um, I do not plan to leave planet Earth for the foreseeable future. However, there are a lot of people that do want to travel to Mars. So if, if you're one of those crazy, crazy people, check this out. From Jalopnik over at jalopnik.com, 10 weirdest facts about space travel. That's right. We're kind of space heavy this episode. Uh, this is a pretty cool uh, article that I ran across Uh Basically, it's a compilation of 10 uh, wacky facts about space travel. We're going to kind of keep this family safe, but the 10th one uh, involves body parts not working as well in space, largely due to the fact that you have lower blood pressure. If you're a guy, I think you know what I mean. Um, number nine, water acts as jelly out there. This is very true. You should uh, see, There's a YouTube video here of an experiment where they show how water behaves in space. It's very much like jelly. Pretty neat. Uh, number eight, lightning almost aborted Apollo, Apollo 12. Pretty interesting. Number seven, sat nav in space. Number six, astronauts are time travelers. Number five, NASA used to let commanders name their spacecraft with hilarious results. This I thought was funny. Uh, number four, space smells like fried steak and burning metal. Kind of an interesting uh, 
observation that uh, guys who who go out uh, in spacesuits for spacewalks, when they come back in, their equipment picks up a smell uh, that uh, <clears throat> is very distinct. So pretty interesting. Uh, number three, astronauts grow in space. This is true. Your spinal cord tends to, to not be quite so compressed due to the fact that there's less gravity and you uh, gain about two inches in space. Uh, of course, you lose those two inches when you come back down here to Earth, but still, nonetheless, pretty interesting. Uh, number two, the International Space Station is falling. That's right. It is not in high orbit. It is in low Earth orbit, which means it's not completely out of the atmosphere. And so as a result, over time, it slows down. And as it slows down, its altitude lowers. And so they have to, you know, speed it back up to get it back up to the appropriate altitude. Pretty interesting. And number one, you are doing 872,405 miles per hour standing still. That's right. Planet Earth is hurtling through space, which means we are all flying through space at 872,405 miles per hour. That is blisteringly fast. So uh, pretty neat. From Mashable.com, BlackBerry CEO is saying that the demand for tablets will die out in five years. Well, <clears throat> we all know how BlackBerry is dying a slow, painful death. So I think what he's really saying is BlackBerry is not going to be around. RIM is not going to be around in five years. I think that's what he's saying. I'm pretty sure that's what he's saying. Um, clearly he, he's unaware of, of how phenomenally well tablets are doing. And in many instances, you know, how the vast majority of people use, uh, you know, computers and I'm using air quotes here for those of you who aren't watching the video, you know, they would very much rather prefer a tablet, you know, uh, simply because a tablet does 99% of, you know, what they want to do. Everybody here in my house, except me, exclusively uses iPhones and iPads. I'm the only one that actually uses a, an actual computer. And that's largely because I do a lot of, you know, multimedia and it's kind of hard to do that on a tablet. Anyway, um, you know, there's still some tasks I, you know, uh, you know, the, the computer is very much like a pickup truck. Not everybody needs a pickup truck. You know, Steve Jobs said it right uh, when he said, you know, we're going into a transition where the computer itself is very much like the pickup truck. You're going to use it for certain utilitarian type things, but for the vast majority of your needs, it's unnecessary. And, um, you know, this is proving out to be true. The CEO here of BlackBerry obviously doesn't, I don't know what planet he's from, but clearly he is unaware of that. Uh, from Engadget, the Canon 5D Mark III firmware update enables improved autofocus and uncompressed HDMI output. For those of you who are uh, amateur or semi-pro or independent filmmakers, this is a huge boon. Uh, you get nice, clean uh, 422 video over the HDMI that doesn't run through uh, the compressor of the camera first. So it's, and, and it's clean, which is, you know, probably absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, it, it, if you own a 5D Mark III, by all means, go grab that firmware update and get your stuff updated. From Gizmodo, how to use a light meter to improve your photography. Now, this is one of those things uh, that uh, caught my eye simply because I use a light meter of sorts when I shoot the show here. Um, the video camera that I use has a built-in light meter. This is how it auto exposes. And um, essentially what I have here is, is a, uh, let me get this over here. Essentially what I have here is an exposure card. This is used to set the exposure on the camera and a white balance card. Now, if you'll notice, this is in fact white and this is in fact black. And so um, 
I use these two in conjunction before I start filming. I set the exposure in the camera. So I turn on all, all the lights on that I shoot with. I use a three point lighting setup. Um, or at least as close to one as I can get here in this room. Let everything warm up. Uh, you know, have the camera on ready to go manually set the exposure and how you do it basically is you use the exposure card you put it up here you zoom in so that it fills the entire frame and you have it at an angle so that you know it's you know basically where my face is and uh then you go and you and the camera you leave it on auto expose the camera will then go in auto light meter itself and auto expose itself and then you set it to manual and it keeps it at that setting now, I usually step it down a quarter of an f-stop from that because the HFM 500 that I'm using tends to ever so slightly overexpose. I may try bumping it down half an f-stop, but a quarter of an f-stop thus far has given me good results. And then you basically do the same thing for white balance. Once it's appropriately exposed, you replace the exposure gray card with the white balance card. You place it here. You don't use a sheet of white paper to set the white balance. That's not how it works. You do, in fact, should use a white balance card that is calibrated. You place it, you know, zoomed in. You place it on there, same as before. And then you go and manually set the white balance while uh, zoomed in on the white balance card. And th that allows the camera to appropriately set its exposure and set its white balance and then when you're done you just zoom out leave those set at their manual settings and the video that you're seeing now is in camera uh, appropriately exposed and appropriately white balanced i don't do any color balancing or exposure or any processing after the fact i literally pull the video off the camcorder and edit it to, uh, you know do my cuts uh, beginning and end and if there's anything in the middle that I want to cut out I cut that out and render it out and upload it and that you are literally seeing what's coming off the camcorder um, I don't like I said I don't do any white balance in post I don't do any of that stuff in post you're literally seeing the camera output as it captures it and every camera if you can manually set the white balance and manually set the exposure you can get results just like this assuming you have an appropriate lighting setup. Anyway, uh, along the same veins as this, Gizmodo has this, how to use a light meter to improve your photography. It's very much, you know, kind of along the same veins. It tells you how to kind of go through and, you know, make sure that you've got enough light. It allows you to set your exposure correctly, all that good stuff. So, you know, pretty interesting. Uh, definitely check it out. From Geeky Gadgets, Olympia Circuit Arno Shield offers an easier Arduino learning curve. That's right. Olympia Circuit has designed a new Arno Shield, which it has created to make the learning curve with Arduino, Arduino a little easier. The new Arno Shield is equipped with all the buttons and lights you need to enjoy building over 40 educational projects. This is definitely a good thing uh, for those of you who are kind of getting started in Arduino and want to you know, see what it's all about. Definitely check it out. Uh, also from Geeky Gadgets, iOS 7. For those of you who are iPhone users, we've had iOS 6 with us now for uh, a little while. Uh, apparently, iOS 7 will be coming out here in the not-too-distant future. And by all the rumors that have been flying around, iOS 7 is going to get a new design. The user interface is going to be... Uh, according to sources, less skeuomorphic. If you don't know what skeuomorphic is, is uh, looks a lot less like uh, real items, like the, you know, <laughs> the note application does, you know, if you look here, the note application looks like a sheet of note paper, kind of offensive. Actually, I am not a fan of skeuomorphic. Uh, same thing with the, let's see here. The calendar on the iPad looks like a real calendar with like a little leather bound. It's, yeah, a gigantic waste of screen real estate, if you ask me, for a lot of the skeuomorphic stuff. So apparently it's going to be a little uh, flattened, a little less skeuomorphic, a little more streamlined. Johnny Ives, the uh, guy responsible for all of the, 
uh, hardware designs is now also responsible for the look and feel of the user interface on all this hardware. So it should be pretty interesting to see what comes of it. Um, I'm curious to see what comes of it. Um, it should be pretty cool. That will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes. As always, do visit us online over at quicksurf.com and uh, see all of you on the next episode. We'll see you then. Bye.